Alonso. I'm the director of the Ethel R. Wolf Institute for the Humanities at Brooklyn College, and it is an honor to welcome you to an event to celebrate the publication of Professor Benjamin Carp's recent book, The Great New York Fire of 1776, A Lost Story of the American Revolution. This is actually uh, the first of five events that we're hosting this month to celebrate the new books published by Brooklyn College faculty. They're listed on the flyer you received when you walked in. We would love to see you uh, during this series. I should also note that we are currently live streaming. There are people watching us online. Uh, this will be recorded, and it will be uploaded to the YouTube channel for the Wolf Institute. Now, as I was preparing for today's event, I realized that this book, and Professor Carr and the Wolf Institute has some history. Back in 2019-2020, uh, Professor Carp received the Wolf Institute's Faculty Fellowship to assist with the research and writing of this project. At the time, one of our external reviewers noted that this book would be, quote, an important contribution for us to make substantial impact within the field and reach a broader reading public. Another reviewer explained that, quote, Carp's project, while purely based on significant primary research, also manages to do what any captivating humanities project accomplishes. Tell us a great story with relevance for today's reader. And I must say that the book has lived up to those early reviews. So please join me in extending a round of applause for Professor Carr. Now, you didn't come to see me, you came to see them. So I'm going to introduce our speakers and then turn it over to them. Uh, Benjamin Carp is the Daniel M. Lyons Professor of American History at Brooklyn College, and he teaches at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. His latest book is The Great New York Fire of 1776, A Lost Story of the American Revolution from Yale University Press, 2023. He's also, he also wrote Defiance of the Patriots, the Boston Tea Party, and the Making of America, also from Yale University Press, 2010 which won the Cox Book Prize from the Society of the Cincinnati in 2013, and Rebels Rising, Cities and the American Revolution from Oxford University Press, 2007. He has written about nationalism and firefighters and wet nurses and Benjamin Franklin and Quaker merchants in Charleston for scholarly journals like the Early American Studies, Civil War History, New York History, and the William and Mary Quarterly and for public, public, uh, popular publications such as the BC, BBC History, Colonial Williamsburg, The Wall Street Journal, and The Washington Post. He received his BA from Yale University and his PhD from the University of Virginia, and he previously taught at the University of Edinburgh and Tufts University. 
Today, Professor Carb will be joined in conversation by Barnett Schechter, who is an independent historian and is the author of George Washington's America, A Biography to His Maps, and The Devil's Own Work, The Civil War Draft Riots and the Fight to Reconstruct America, and The Battle for New York, the City at the Heart of the American Revolution. He is a contributor to the Encyclopedia of New York City and various books on the Revolution and the Civil War, including the three volumes, Gripner's Encyclopedia of the American Revolution and Larmarks of the American Revolution. In addition to lecturing and leading tours, he consults on book exhibitions, films, and appears on the History Channel and C-SPAN. He's currently writing a book about anti-slavery activity during the Revolution and the founding era. Welcome to Brooklyn College. And Professor Carp, I turn it over to you. Okay. Um, I, I've given so many talks about the book at this point that I, um, I don't want to give my canned talk at all, except to say that uh, the book is meant to be um, a whodunit, right, uh, about uh, this, uh, this fire that was tr has been treated as a great mystery among historians who burned New uh, about a fifth of New York City uh, uh, in the early morning hours of September 21, 1776, uh, when New York City was arguably at the center of the American Revolution. A lot of dramatic activity happens on that night. British soldiers uh, stab at least one person to death with bayonets uh, because they thought he was interfering with firefighting. Uh, they throw a couple of other people into burning buildings uh, because they suspected of the, uh, them of being incendiaries. Uh, and then, um, you know, and every British and loyalist person on the spot pretty much is convinced that the Americans did this on purpose. And then suddenly the event becomes historically insignificant. Uh, the Americans, you know, basically say, hey, we don't know how this happened. Maybe it was an accident. Who knows? And then that's what historians run with. Uh, and so there are other mysteries, I think, that are kicked up by this fire. I think by looking at this fire, we get a more interesting perspective and a more interesting set of perspectives on the American Revolution than, uh, than we would otherwise get from what uh, the, the Rutgers historian Jan Lewis used to call the bedtime story version uh, of the American Revolution. So those are some of the things uh, that, uh, that I like to say about what the book is doing as a whole. But again, there's lots of little details in there and there's lots of, I hope, uh, interesting themes in there as well. And I hope that um, they'll come out in a more interesting way through, uh, through my conversation with, uh, uh, with Barnett here than, uh, than they would uh, otherwise if I were to just um, give my, uh, my standard lecture. So, uh, and I really hope that his questions will um, allow us to, to segue in a seamless way to questions from the audience as well, because I, I really enjoy the give and take. I honestly think I'm a little bit better off the cuff than I am uh, <laughs> giving prepared remarks, so. Great, well, thank you. I'm, I'm honored and delighted to be here at Brooklyn College with all of you. Thank you for having me, and uh, it's a delight to join Ben in conversation. Um, first of all, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, the book is terrific. It's, it's beautifully written. The clarity of the prose and of the thought, it just shines through. And it is a book that is nothing if not provocative. Uh, I suppose I should say incendiary <laughs> in that, think of it. The Americans burned New York City to the ground, uh, possibly on the orders of George Washington in 1776. Um, it's quite a, uh, a shocking and stunning kind of conclusion that you've come to. And you, you make the case that the best evidence we have really points in that direction. So incendiary in that sense, but also, as you began to suggest, you're also challenging the reader to take a, a different approach to American history, to put aside some of the sort of sentimental patriotism and accept that the birth of this country, uh, you know, came out of flames, out of violence, um, and that the set of characters that we need to look at should really be expanded, that we need to, so in a sense, we need a more clear-eyed, more realistic view of American history, and a more inclusive one, too, I yeah. think you say. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to back up a little bit. I want to get to all of that. I mean, we've kind of given the spoiler, right? We, yeah. We, we have a sense of who might have done it, but... I, I found reading the book, even being very familiar with the topic, that you structured it in a, and your writing made it very suspenseful, even, you know. 
I tried. I was I wasn't sure how much suspense. You know, it's you know. well, it's like tragedy, right? We're yeah. we're riveted. Any kind of tragedy, we're riveted if it's done well, mm-hmm. uh, and we want to see how it happened, even if we know what happened. Yeah. Um, and so that I think it's it's a very success on that level too. But I thought maybe we could back up and talk a little bit about how you came to this project. I mean, I think it's I think it's interesting that your other books seem to organically set you up for this in the sense that, you know, one of the themes that you talk about in the book is that there was a, a real violent streak on on the American side, too, right? It wasn't just British oppressors, but we the, the Boston Tea Party, right? It was a violent act of, of destruction of property. Um, and then in your subsequent book about cities, um, I think you come back to some of those themes here, too, in talking about American attitudes towards cities, um, the kind of the virtue of the hinterland versus the, the kind of sin of the city. I mean, maybe you could talk yeah. a little bit how how those sort of led you in this direction. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, honestly, the order is flipped around. I first became interested in this fire when I was an undergraduate student. Um, I uh, I was a junior. I was taking a seminar, uh, a, a, you know, research seminar. We were you know asked to come up with our own research topics on the American Revolution. Uh, and I got interested in a bunch of topics having to do with fire, fire, right? What did it mean if you were a member of a fire company during the revolutionary era? Are you participating in the riots or are you trying to stop riots from happening? Uh, I got interested in fire as a symbol of political protest. Uh, I got interested in actual towns being burned uh, during the revolutionary war. And I wrote a, 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 what I think is a very bad junior paper as a result of this, because I was trying to mash way too many things together. Um, but then I settled down and I wrote a senior thesis on the firefighters piece of it. But in, in looking at burning things during the revolution, I'd come across the story of the fire and I couldn't let it go. Um, because on the one hand, you know, I saw these secondary sources that say, oh, it's a bit of a mystery. We're not really sure what happened. And then I would look at these primary sources, some of which are absolutely convinced that this was done as a deliberate act. And so, you know, why is this anomaly there? Right. That was what I was uh, trying to look at. And so that was 20-something years ago at this point. Uh, And I did write an article about the fire, kind of making this claim initially that it was people sympathetic to the Americans who had burned the town. And that came out back in 2006. But I still felt that it needed a full treatment. Now, along the way, right, I wrote the city's book. I wrote the Tea Party's book. I was still developing some of these these ideas. But I also, um, every time I would go to an archive, I was like, uh, I would say, oh, I wonder what they were writing in the fall of 76, right? Did they hear anything about the fire? Are there any rumors that I could take down? Um, and so in my various archive trips, I, w- I would keep on looking for it. And I, I had some ideas for books that I didn't get off the ground. Like I was originally going to write a book on, a comprehensive book on the destruction of town cities, and, and Indian settlements during the, during the Revolutionary War. Uh, and uh, because it's extensive, right? But then I decided, well, that's going to be a lot of wide-ranging research. I don't know that the intellectual payoff will be as big. What if I did a more focused story on this fire that has always been uh, uh, of so much interest? And especially after I came to Brooklyn College and knew I had a New York City-based job, I was kind of like, why not write a a, a New York City-based book and talk about this mystery that was at the kind of heart of 1776, right? An anniversary or a year that looms so large in our minds as a year of American origins. What was it actually like to live through 1776? Did everyone just wake up, decide the Declaration of of Independence was this great idea, and then we became this glorious nation? No, it turns out that a couple of months later, there's this devastating fire um, that that, that destroys a, a fifth of the city. So it's fascinating to see how abiding and interested it's been for you. Um, so let me pick up with that. What was it like to be in New York in, the, the, let's say, the spring of, of 1776 um, as, the, as the armies were converging on the city? Maybe just give us a sense of what the city was like. What was about before the war? What was about 25,000 people yeah. Yeah. Um, in about a, a mile square, the southern tip of Manhattan? Yeah, not a lot of people living above what we what would today be Canal Street, maybe a little bit in the Bowery, but aside from that, most of Manhattan was rural. Right. And in terms of, um, can you give us a sense of, you know, physically what the city was like, and and also maybe behind the scenes a little bit, 
some of the um, kind of sectarian conflict, right, between Presbyterians and Anglicans, which was kind of woven into the political rivalries of the time and the big families. Yeah, New York was a politically complicated place. There were a lot of people who would eventually become loyalists. There was a lot. There were a lot of people who would become committed patriots to the to the rebellious side. Uh, yeah, it was a, a, an ethnically and religiously very diverse place. You know, uh, within the American colonies, um, there were there had been rivalries and factions throughout the, the the colonial history. And you know, right up until the Declaration of Independence, New York City isn't really committing one way or the other to what they're going to do. The British Navy kind of controls the harbor throughout, but eventually the rebels kind of take over on land. Um, and it's this really uncomfortable situation. Washington himself shows up on April 13th. Uh, and for the, for the rest of the spring, the summer, and uh, you know up to the solstice, basically, uh, it's an American-occupied town. Uh, with troops living in people's houses, you know, and many of the much of the civilian population having evacuated. So New York City as a kind of occupied city by the Americans is this weird and sometimes very violent place. And then for the rest of the war, it's going to be a British occupied um, a, a place until evacuation day on November 25th, 1783, when Washington finally is able to return to New right. York City. And, and for the purposes of talking about the fire, you, I think you also mentioned that there were some fine brick homes, right? But there were also a lot of wooden structures. Um, but also interesting that a lot of the course of the fire um, was along the Lower West Side, yeah. and which was mostly church property, right? Yeah. Anglican, the Trinity Parish. So it was, it was the Anglican church. Um, so that, that will throw an interesting wrinkle into people's suspicions about who said it and what their motives were, that maybe there was... Uh, it was an attack on the Church of England in some sense, right? Um, so diverse, right? Lots of lots of church steeples and church bells, right? Um, but a, a very compact town. Um, and as you say, um, you know, religiously, a lot of tensions, religious and political. But I think you also mentioned that New York had had some fires in the past, right? And, and even one that was related to uh, suppressing a a suspected slave rebellion Yeah, well, earlier in the century? Yes. Well, New York City had actually been pretty lucky, right? Like Montreal, Charleston, South Carolina, and Boston had all had major fires in the 18th century that burned an entire neighborhood. Um, but New York City hadn't really had that uh, 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 for the most part. Most of its fires were isolated, were put out in time, don't become kind of major conflagrations that burn lots and lots of buildings until 1776. Later in the 19th century, New York City, still largely made of wood, is going to have more major fires in 1835 and 1845. Uh, but colonial New York City had been pretty lucky as far as fires went. Um, fires that became famous, even though they weren't that damaging, were the series of fires that were called the so-called Negro Conspiracy of 1741, uh, uh, when uh, supposedly the authorities believed that there had been a plot hatched by the enslaved community in New York City, possibly in conjunction with the Catholic Church, designed to destroy the city in the midst of the War of Jenkins' Year uh, uh, in order to damage the uh, the Anglo-American war effort. Um, probably it wasn't really that extensive a conspiracy. They executed a lot of uh, enslaved people and some white people for that conspiracy anyway. Um, and it's become an event that's been a fascination to historians. But as far as actual fire damage, uh, not that much, and uh, and uh, and New Yorkers still build in wood. You know, maybe not for the fanciest homes, uh, but New York City's a pretty economically stratified pl place back then, uh, and so lots of humbler dwellings were built of wood and were therefore <laughs> extremely combustible, vulnerable. Yeah. yeah, but I think you know the point is interesting that that New York was very much implicated in the slave trade and in slavery, and that kind of you know paranoia about slave rebellions and the, the brutal reaction, um, you know, it's something that we maybe would associate, most of us would associate with something in the Deep South, but... Or Haiti, right? Or, or Haiti, Jamaica, right? yeah. Um, and so it's it's kind of chilling to know that that was going on in New York as well. Yeah, I, I just want to say something about that. When I talk about the tension and kind of compressed violence, you know, or potential for violence that's there at every moment, 
I really think that slavery is part of that, because on the one hand, right, like the system of slavery is itself built on violence, but you also have this paranoia on behalf of whites that, oh, the enslaved people might turn around and revolt or commit small acts of murder against their masters at any time. And so, like, it's it's worth thinking about, like, having an enslaved population is going to have some, make you feel inherently unstable uh, for that, uh, for that reason, because the whole system is designed to prevent your labor force from freely just walking off the job. And, uh, and that requires a certain amount of, of violent coercion. And there's going to be a reaction to, to that if possible, um, uh, on the part of the enslaved. It's very, very corrosive. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, some of the cities, you know, in the, in the beginnings of the American Revolutionary War that were less fortunate. Um, Falmouth, and what's now Maine, right? Um, Norfolk, Virginia. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I thought maybe you could also talk about the example of Boston. So just to kind of, you know, give a coherent narrative, right? The, we started we talking about the Boston Tea Party, right? the response to British taxation, the British clamp down, on, on the port of Boston, cut off all trade, and uh, bring mil- militarily occupy uh, the city and the area. Um, and of course, then when they go out to try to seize rebel uh, arm- ammunition and gunpowder, we have Lexington and Concord, right, and Bunker Hill. Um, and that precipitates a siege of Boston uh, with the Continental Army uh, under George Washington cooping the British up in Boston, eventually starving them out, basically, after about almost a year. So until March of beginning in, in April, May of 1775, culminating in the British retreat uh, from Boston up to Nova Scotia uh, in March of 76. Um, but maybe you could talk a little bit about that moment when Washington is has basically succeeded in, in driving the British out, but there has to be a, a handoff of the city. I think it's just an interesting kind of counterpoint to what happens in New York. Yeah, I mean, two things that I like to think of about Boston is, one is, on June 17, 1775, at the Battle of Bunker Hill, if you were, you know, in the North End, you would have seen Charlestown, Massachusetts, right across the, the mouth of the Charles, burn to the ground, right, during the British attack. They send in men to burn the town of Charlestown because some American troops have been using it to, as cover to fire on British troops. So they just burned this entire, like, kind of town right next to Boston um, without, you know, hundreds of homes. Um, and this is one of the things that the Americans complain about in the Declaration of Independence, that King George III has burnt our towns. Uh, it was only a few towns in New England at the time, but uh, this really looms large in the Americans' mindset that British will stop at nothing. They're, they're, they're going to wantonly destroy the homes of their own subjects. This is why the Americans need to be independent. Uh, but before the Declaration of Independence, yeah, Washington is able to get some cannons up there on Dorchester Heights, uh, motivate the, the British to want to evacuate. And the, the Americans had talked about like, hey, if we go in and storm Boston to try and take it from the British, there's a real risk that the British will set it on fire rather than let us take Boston back. We know that the British don't like Boston anyway. They've been, a, you know, Boston had been a thorn in the side of King George III and his customs officers for 10 years. What if the British just burn the place? Or what if we end up burning the place, you know, in trying to take it from the British, right? Are we okay with that level of property destruction? And Washington actually gets his, his blessing from the Continental Congress. John Hancock, who was the wealthiest man in Boston, said, even though I would be the greatest sufferer, right, I authorize this attack. And so Congress is very up front, like, if this city has to be burned, we'll all take responsibility for it. It's for the benefit of everybody, even though we would be sacrificing the third largest city in the colonies and one that had inspired so many to revolt, uh, you know, after the uh, after the course of acts had been passed. So they're ready. And the British, too, are like, hey, if the Americans mess with us on our way out, we're going to set this place on fire. And so Washington and Howe end up having this kind of gentleman's agreement that if it, that if the British are allowed to evacuate unscathed, right, uh, and Washington is allowed to take the city, you know, that, that neither side will try and burn the town. Uh, it, you know, as long as no violence is committed, as long as everything's pe- relatively peaceful, there won't be chaos, right? The British will leave the city as they left it. I mean, the British had kind of destroyed the city in other ways because they were using churches as like 
for horse riding practice. And, you know, that's not really good for the interior of a church for a lot of reasons. Um, but uh, but the, the city is not, it's filled with smallpox, but it's not burned down. Um, and so, uh, so that precedent was there, right? And then Washington goes straight from there, basically, to New York City, from Boston almost having been burned in a way that I think very few people appreciated, although the the, the town selectmen of Boston are like, thank you, Washington, you've taken the city and we get to keep it intact. Um, but this is on everybody's minds, I think, uh, as everybody's thinking about New York. Now, the army around Boston had mostly been New Englanders. They liked Boston. They're like, oh, Congregationalist churches, you know, uh, 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 we admire the, the ministers of Boston, you know, all this other stuff. But New York you know, this army of not all New Englanders, but a plurality of New Englanders, they had mixed feelings about New York. You know, New York was a center for the Church of England. Uh, New York was supposedly a more sinful place. Uh, you, you know, New York made New Englanders uncomfortable. New York seemed to have more loyalists than Boston did. It definitely had more loyalists than, than Boston did, but it wasn't necessarily as loyalist a town as the New Englanders thought. But again, there are all these perceptions of New York that make it all the more vulnerable to American arm uh, to an American army being like, hmm, what if we burned this place down? Absolutely. So, as Washington is moving the army down from from Boston, let let's talk for a moment about what you point out as New York's being this the kind of essential strategic prize. Yeah. In in North America, regarded as so by both sides, by the Americans and the British. Do you want to? talk a little bit about that. Too. Yeah, yeah. John Adams says that New York is a kind of a key to the whole continent, right? And he talks about how New York City gives you access not just to Long Island and Jersey and Connecticut, but up the Hudson River into the Hudson, the fertile Hudson River Valley, and then, you know, and then to all, all the way up to Albany, and then with a little bit of portaging to Lake Champlain uh, and even Canada. And so that like having control over that becomes this British fantasy for um, controlling the middle colonies, having a, uh, a, a, a point from which to try and control or at least isolate New England. And so the Americans really think, hey, we've got to hold on to this place if we can. And the British are like, hey, we've got to take this place if we want to prevent these 13 colonies from making good on their, uh, on their revolution. Right. So if, if the British could come down from Canada with one army up from New York City, uh, link arms at, at Albany, they could really kind of split the colonies in half, right? Isolate, as you say, isolate New England from New York and Virginia and all the rest. Yeah, I mean, that becomes John Burgoyne's plan in 1777, but uh, in 1776, they're going to do the first step and at least try and take New York City. Okay, great. So, so we have a sense of, of why the armies are converging on New York. We see George Washington arriving there after the army in the spring. In the meantime, a lot of work has been going on, right? The Charles Lee had come down in February, sent by Washington to sort of spearhead the, the defenses of the city. Lots of digging, chopping down trees, putting up roadblocks, building forts in Manhattan, on Manhattan, but also over in Brooklyn, right, trying to close off the mouth of the East River. Um, so really bracing New York for, for the arrival of a British armada, essentially, right? Yeah, I mean, the, without a navy, there's not a heck of a lot they can do about British warships, except for, you know, do their best to, to make life miserable for any British attackers. Uh, right. So, I mean, Washington was sort of faced with a, lot, a couple of bad options, right? I mean, yeah. you had to choose between sort of concentrating his army or dispersing it hopelessly across two rivers and three three land masses, right? Yeah, how's he supposed to guess where to concentrate most of his forces? The British have their, their ships, and once they take Long Island especially, they can land anywhere. Um, and so even if he has about the same number of soldiers as the British, and he does, he has to spread them out over um, what's now the South Bronx and New Jersey uh, and, uh, and Upper Manhattan and Lower Manhattan, right? He, like, you know, before Staten Island and Long Island are taken, he has to commit some of his troops there. So, you know, he has to spread out his forces so much that, uh, you know, the British can just, you know, choose their own target of opportunity, uh, really. And, uh, and there's not a heck of a lot that, uh, that Washington can, can do. So, he, yeah, he has these, two, these, these bad options. He can either stand and try and defend, which may lead to much of his army being killed or having to surrender, or he can just retreat, right? He, he retreated from Long Island. He retreated from Staten Island. He retreated from Long Island. 
maybe he'll have to retreat from Manhattan as well. Then the question becomes, okay, do you retreat and burn the place behind you, or do you retreat and leave it intact for an occupying British army and navy? Right. And, and even prior to that, Washington had to discuss with Congress whether it was worth trying to make a stand in New York at all, right? Yeah. Um, so that was in part, would you say, a political decision more than a military one? I mean, the idea of just giving up the second largest city with yeah, any kind of fight. Right. It's political and it has to do with the morale of his own troops. Yeah. I mean, on the, like on the one hand, like constantly surrendering looks really bad, you know, but on the other hand, burning cities also looks really bad. And it's not something that Washington wanted to take responsibility for on his own. He needed, you know, he like he was very concerned about his reputation. He didn't want to be seen as some like, you know, uh, 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 warlord who was just burning cities everywhere. You know, he wanted to do it by the book if he was going to do it. And so he does ask Congress, like, what he should do. And he was, you know, all the biographers of Washington say how respectful he was of civilian authority, et cetera. Uh, so he's, he's there in, in April. You mentioned that he arrived in April of 1776. Uh, the British juggernaut, we might call it, arrives in late June. Early July, they're already encamping on Staten Island. And then we have the great Battle of Brooklyn, the largest battle of the war. Uh, on August 27th, uh, and and then the Americans escaped to Manhattan and essentially pushed out, gradually pushed out of the New York area, um, and that seems to be a, a key moment in your in your story, right? I mean, we're getting pretty close to ignition. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Again, like by the end of August, the uh, uh, the British now control Brooklyn and Queens essentially. Uh, which gives them a lot of opportunities for just crossing over the East River and invading Manhattan. And the, uh, you know, and in early September, the British are still, uh, the Americans are still there on Lower Manhattan. Uh, you know, by the, you know, by uh, I forget what date in early September Washington's like. All right, I'm not going to stay in the city anymore. I'm going to go up to Washington Heights, right? And he he's hanging out at the, the Morris Jumel Mansion, which you can still visit today. At the time, it was the Morris Mansion, but uh, you know, so he he's able, he uses that as his headquarters. And is he going to? He, he he's eventually going to decide. I have to pull pull as much of my army back to the heights as I can. He do, but he does leave some troops uh, on September fifteenth. There are still some troops in Lower Manhattan and some troops on the East River. Uh, you know, waiting to receive a possible British invasion that they all know is is coming. And so then on that date we have the famous Kipps Bay invasion. Right? Yeah, uh, British. Actually, they they uh, requested a peace conference. On September 11th, uh, on Staten Island, right, which essentially leads nowhere. Right. Uh, the Americans are not willing to trade away independence for a royal pardon and being welcomed back into the fold. So that that collapses. Um, and then the 15th, they they say, okay, we're taking the gloves off. They send flatboats out of Newtown Creek, and this major invasion of, of the island. Um, and so by by the 16th, um, they really control all of Manhattan up to, say, the, the top of what's now Central Park. Um, and Americans will have a small morale-building victory right, at the Battle of Harlem Heights, um, essentially fought across what's now uh, that valley, which uh, used to be called the Hollow Way, which is now 125th Street on the west side. Um, and so... But what's what's happening down in the city? That's really kind of the key key to our story. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to follow two things at that point. One is what's the mood in the in the American army, having had all these retreats, Washington having been complaining about them for months because of their their disobedience and their propensity to desert. So he's not exactly happy with his own army, and the army did not re like. Maybe they had this morale boost on the 16th, but the day before. The Connecticut troops in particular were said to have, like, really not acquitted themselves well of, like, you know, this this hasty retreat. They don't even make a respectable stand against the British uh, uh, invasion. So there's all this recrimination being traded among American officers from different parts of the 13 colonies and the soldiers themselves. And it's it's really ugly. And then in the city, there's a lot of hinky stuff going on, um, you know. Uh, some people who were recognized as American troops sort of left behind and wandering around in civilian clothing, loyalists beginning to come back, the British trying to set up a little bit of 
you know, uh, 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 structures in place of the former civilian government. Let's start a fire service. Let's try and get things in order here. Let's arrange housing for people moving back and for our own officers. So there's a there's a quite a bit of chaos. Like the British raised the Union Jack, uh, and you know, and and they're prepared now for this to be British headquarters. But it's tense. Uh, you know, the, the the guy who's appointed the fire chief, John Baltus Dash, is like. I'm going to bury my valuables in the lo- in the yard because I'm anticipating that there's going to be some kind of fire, and I want to make sure that some of my most valuable papers are going to be safe from the uh, from the fire when it comes. So there's a it, it's 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 a very tense atmosphere in these six days between the 15th and the 21st. Right, and I think this also points to what you characterize as a civil war. Right, that this is a revolution. We we think of it as a revolution, but in fact. At the time, it was very much as it felt as a civil war that, uh, you know, to, to, to the loyalist residents, the arrival of the British was the liberation of the city, right? Uh, whereas the, the rebels considered it uh, an occupation or an invasion. Um, so very, very different points of view in, in the same town. Um, I think it's, it's interesting what you're starting to say about the, the New England troops. There's maybe talk a little bit about this sort of culture, this culture gap uh, between sort of New England and, and New Yorkers. You, you touched on it a little bit earlier, but I think it's also fascinating that the, the New Englanders, these congregationalists, they had a certain idea about military service, right? That they were entering into it willingly, that they were independent, um, autonomous, and, and that they were signing a contract. And if the contract wasn't met, they were within their rights to demand more food or more money or even to, to leave, right? And how does that play into the dynamic in, in New York? Yeah, most of the rest of the 13 colonies, there's a little bit more of a culture of, like, you do what your betters tell you, right? Not that, you know, the New Yorkers couldn't, you know, working class New Yorkers didn't have their own culture of resistance. But, like, once you were in a, a military service, there was sort of an understanding that you were supposed to sort of do what your officers tell you. But New Englanders, yeah, have this more contractual tradition, uh, of, of, of militia service, uh, and that that's still that's still something they're carrying through in terms of their uh, uh, in terms of their own beliefs as soldiers. Yeah. Right, and contrast that with Washington, the Virginian, right? This gentleman, you know, this fox hunting, slave owning uh, gen- gentleman, uh, and it, it's a kind of, almost a kind of cavalier tradition, right? It's almost a chivalric tradition, which, as you say, is very much about deference. Um, and so that that adds an element of, I think, suspense and suspicion in your tale as well, right? About, and you said before that the New Englanders didn't have a kind of affection for New York um, that they might have had for Boston or elsewhere. Um, so let's let's get to the the main event. <laughs> We're edging up on the twenty first. Can you bring us bring us into those? fiery days. Yeah, I mean, so the, the you know, uh, so there's two versions of the story that you can sort of tell. One is the story that suggests that it was an accident, right? Uh, uh, I have eyewitnesses who say, I saw the fire break out in Whitehall Slip. It might have been because there was drinking going on the night before and somebody left a candle unattended. Uh, it lights up, the wind shifts, um, you know, the, the, the fire begins to spread, jumps across Broadway, um, the wooden shingles, get lifted up by the wind and they become flaming brands. If any of you have ever seen video of the Paradise Fire in California, uh, you know that like wind can blow, um, you know, uh, pieces of wood that are on fire and make things catch fire at a great distance without it even having to be contiguous. Uh, And so an entire swath of the city burns and maybe the whole thing was an accident, right, uh, under that narrative. But then there were other people who said, I saw the fire break out in three places at once. I saw the fire break out in 15 places at once. I saw people skulking around, interfering with fire, uh, firefighting equipment, carrying incendiary materials, actively holding torches up to a building. Um, you know, seeing all this stuff, uh, people cutting the handles of fire buckets so that you can't lift them up very easily. Uh, 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 people um, actively trying to get in firefighters' way as they were trying to use the fire engine to put these things out. Um the, uh, and, you know, I mean, there were all sorts of reasons why New York City caught fire that night. Uh, there weren't enough civilians in town. There weren't enough firefighters in town. The bells had all been removed by the rebel army to be melted into cannon. Uh, so there, no alarm was sounded uh, in, in time. 
And the truth is, even in modern fire science, once a fire gets big enough and hot enough, it's very difficult to stop. I mean, if you've seen an 18th century fire, uh, fire engine, it can pump a little bit of water. But if you've got a whole building up in flames, there's really nothing you can do except for tear down an adjacent building so that the fire has nowhere to go. Um, and even then, again, if the wind is high enough, there's very little that you can do to stop just like tons and tons of flaming brands, uh, you know, traveling westward, sweeping up and burning all of this area uh, west of Broadway. In fact, let me... Um, let me just show people on the uh, on the map if I um, uh, see if the if the picture comes back. Uh, oh, it's muted. I see. Okay, so um, I've got all these great. Like, here's an image of the fire, uh, and I have all these great maps. This one I think is a, a little bit better known, but the shade. You know, all these map makers were like, "I'm going to shade the area of New York that was destroyed." Uh, here's an image we can talk about later. In this one, they simply erased the blocks that had existed in New York um, to show what had been burned. So I, I want to leave this one up because this map uh, is up at Albany and it's not as well known. But this is Whitehall Slip, where the fire supposedly started. Uh, and um, and this is everything that uh, that burned. Now, if you look at a like if you look at it as a kind of contiguous area like that, you might say, oh, well, that makes sense. If it was an accidental fire, the wind did all of the work. Um, but people were caught, according to eyewitnesses, in other parts of the city as well. Um, and again, those fires didn't end up burning that area of the city, which actually was the more valuable part. Um, but nevertheless, right, like, so again, like, I, I wonder sometimes whether the maps even mislead us um, to some degree. But I love uh, uh, this map and the Blaskowitz map uh, 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 in particular, which is at uh, Bolnwick Castle uh, in Northumberland. Um, because they're not as well known and they show in really vivid terms uh, how much of the city was destroyed and what that meant. So let's talk a little bit about the British reaction and what investment they had in different versions of, of the fire. Yeah, there, there's, there are some rumors, and these rumors don't go anywhere, but there are some rumors that maybe drunken British sailors had started the fire. But it becomes clear to everyone that the British are doing their best to stop this fire from happening. Uh, James Robertson, who was who, had, who actually owned a mansion on Broadway, uh, he was a British general, but he owned a mansion on Broadway and lived there basically since the seven year owned this property since the Seven Years' War. He actively says that he diverted the fire from the East River commercial area so that the fire burned his own house. Um, you know, and he later makes a claim for damages um, that his own house is burned as he is. He was the commandant of the city and he was helping to direct firefighting efforts. In coordination with the civilian firefighters, British troops, Brit the, 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 the British Navy sends sailors in their boats uh, to the East River docks to help. They drop men off. Sa soldiers and sailors work together with civilians to try their best to put out the fire or at least contain it. And so it's clear that the British are, like wanted New York City as its headquarters and were doing their utmost to try and save the city. Right. So, I mean, it makes sense for the British, right? Here's a city that... Uh, not only is the key to the continent in terms of getting to the interior, but it's got this great harbor uh, for their navy, mm -hmm. and it's it's right in the middle of the Atlantic seaboard. They can go and blockade New England, or they can go on a campaign in the south. Um, it seems to be the perfect spot for them. And you need a city to supply it, to repair your ship, to get new, you know new rigging, you know fix your rope, whatever you know. You need the manufacturing capacity of a city. Um, to, uh, uh, to, to help maintain your navy. Plus, plus the agricultural output of, of Long Island, right? All the farms being the breadbasket of the city. Um, and so it's a, it's a tremendous loss. And not to mention how many built, what, 4,000 buildings in the city and about 1,000 of them are now gone, right? So there goes your winter quarters um, and maybe, you know, especially the quarters that the soldiers are going to be housed in, right? Those more modest wooden buildings. Yeah, not, I mean, not just for your soldiers, but think of all the, lo like the, the loyalists who re are returning to the city, but also loyalist refugees, right, who uh, you know, all of a sudden didn't feel comfortable in their own communities anymore um, and are going to flock to New York to, uh, to have the protection of the British Army. All these people need a place to sleep, and you've now just taken out a, a, a fifth of the city's housing capacity. Um, and and the, although the intention was probably to take out even more of it. Uh, and Washington leader says, laments that, like, more of the city hadn't burned. 
Um, right. Um, yeah, and that's, I mean, that's what I want to ask you about, too. There's this, there's a story that Washington was standing on the balcony of the Morris House, right? So about 14 miles north of the city, um, up in what's now Harlem, uh, or maybe maybe we would call it Hamilton Heights or well, Washington, yeah, Washington Heights, Washington yeah, Heights. Yeah. yeah, right on the border there. Um, and but the story is that he could see a red glow on the horizon um, when the city was burning, and that he he supposedly said something to the effect of, you know, Providence or some good honest fellow has done more for us than we were disposed to do for ourselves. So the suggestion, of course, is that, you know, oh, we didn't do it, but, you know, it certainly serves our purposes. Um, yeah, really interestingly, I don't think that letter was well known to historians until the 1940s uh, in the Fitzpatrick writings of, of Washington. The correspondence between Washington and Congress was known, that had been made public in the 1780s. But that letter, to, to, which is to his cousin Lund, the caretaker of Mount Vernon, uh, appears in an appendix, actually, to the Fitzpatrick edition of the writings of George Washington in, I forget what year, but it's the 1940s, mm. um, so, which I find re really interesting, right, that that, you know, that, that that ironic twist on the fire isn't there until later. But yeah, as far as that red glow, uh, there was no light pollution at the time, right? So people, but, so people were, were, found it remarkable that you could see a pin on the ground by the light of that fire in northern Manhattan. People said they could see the fire for as far away as New Haven, That's, which I think is like 70 miles away. Like, so if you think about like, you know, being like the fire being that vivid in an otherwise empty night sky, um, I just find that really remarkable. So let's dig a little deeper though. I mean, you said that that letter was, wasn't known for quite a while, um, but was there some, it seems like you've, you've explored pretty carefully the the interaction between Washington and Congress, and there's a kind of disclaiming going on, right? Washington saying, um, I think in that same letter to Lund, he, or maybe another letter to Lund, or to John Augustine, his brother, he said something about, you know, if it were up to me, I would have laid the city in ashes. Yeah, that's the same letter. Right? The same letter, yeah. right? And, it's, and it's not, he, he like then writes about other stuff, and then a paragraph later, he's like, "Oh, by the way, there was a fire." But like it's really straight. It's a strange letter. Right. Uh, um, and but the but the conventional story, as you pointed out, is that you know Washington wanted to burn the city for strategic reasons, right? Deprive the British. Um, John Moran Scott, who was one of the officers who had property in New York, you know, was ready to, like Hancock, saying, you know, go ahead, burn it. Um, General Green was saying, you know, we he was referring to kind of um, classical uh, historical examples of, of using scorched earth as a tactic. Um, but the Congress said, no, don't touch the city. You know, it, it'll be too much of a, a blow to morale and we'll get it back. Somehow we'll get it back. Um, but I think you you make a fascinating kind of interpretation of all of that. Yeah, it's as the as the fire um, becomes memory, right? I think one of the most fascinating parts of your book is that really clear-eyed analysis of maybe these statements shouldn't be taken completely at face value. Yeah, it's hard because you can't argue from an absence of evidence. You start to sound like a tinfoil-headed crackpot, right? But, um, uh, but you know, Washington does say at one point, hey, Congress, if you are going to order me to burn this place, make sure you keep it a secret. Now, he says keep it a secret because if the British know that we're going to burn it, that's going to change their plans. But there were many other reasons why you might want to keep plans to burn New York City a secret. So we can imagine that if there were a letter from Congress to Washington saying, Whatever we say in our official correspondence, if you need to burn the city, go ahead. That that letter would not necessarily survive in Washington's papers and come down to us today. That would be exactly the kind of letter that Washington would be like, um, okay, it says burn after reading. Let me put it into the fire. It's not going to be there for historians to consult. So again, you don't want to... You don't want to argue that that's necessarily the case, but it is clear that Washington did think that burning New York City was going to be a good idea strategically. What some historians like John Furling have suggested is, well, maybe he was like, will no one rid me of this meddlesome city? 
and kind of made it clear that this was his desire so that one of his enterprising young officers would be like, hmm, maybe I should get something off the uh, off the ground. Make sure the boss doesn't officially know about it. Wink, wink. But go ahead and do this anyway, because we know the boss thinks it's a good idea. And so maybe, right, some enterprising officer said, you, you and you hide yourself in the city after we evacuate and burn this place. And you, you're stationed in New Jersey, send over a couple of boats full of men, you know, and uh, uh, and you guys too help burn the city and then maybe use those boats to get our guys out of there. Right. That like that this would have been part of a, a kind of coordinated plan. That's the top down version of events. A more bottom up version of events is that there were ordinary soldiers who were like, what? The bosses are saying not to burn the city. But we've been talking about for months about how we want to burn this place on our way out. We, we really want to deprive the British of this place. We hate the loyalists who live in New York City. We hate the Church of England that seems to have so much sway in this town. Like, if, if, you know, if we're evacuating, fine. But 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 me and my buddies, we're going to stick around. We're going to coordinate with some friends we've made among New York City civilians. Uh, and we're going to do the most patriotic thing we can possibly imagine. And we're going to burn this place um, uh, to deprive the, Brit- the British of their headquarters. So, again, like, there's there's no way to know for sure how it happened. In, in a way, it's the same thing as the Boston Tea Party, which nobody really fessed up to having participated in for another like 40 or 50 years after the Boston Tea Party was done. And so we don't know exactly whether the Boston Tea Party was ordered by the wealthy merchants and the town leadership, or whether it was kind of organized spontaneously from below by a bunch of artisans who worked with their hands and said, this is how we're going to protest against the East India Company. Uh, it's quite possible that a Sid Miller pattern prevails here, that it may have been ordered by the guys on high, but it also may have been the idea of ordinary rank and file soldiers and civilians doing their own thing, being more radical than the American leadership itself was willing to be. Right. Well, or maybe, they, as you suggested, they were setting up plausible deniability, but we call right. it. Now. Yeah, but keep, but keep the boss's reputation safe. He's <laughs> right. the gentleman, you know, he's the one who is in all the newspapers, right? We still want French alliance. We might want, you know, uh, British opposition politicians sticking up for us. We might want the British civilian population to demand an end to the war. We're gonna. We, we want the American population to think that we are, you know, uh, building a real country and that we're not just a bunch of yahoos, right? If you want to convince that entire audience that the American Revolution is a good idea and that America deserves to belong to the community of nations, you know, we we want to keep the boss's reputation insulated from this act of incendiarism. I think that would have been the prevailing attitude. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a fascinating aspect of your book that you comb through the evidence, you amass the evidence so painstakingly, and and also you make the convincing case for all the motives that Americans would have had to to tell that story, to suppress any kind of culpability in the, in the fire. It's, it's yeah, the, the interesting thing is I have about a dozen accounts of Ameri- of soldiers in the American army saying. I think, I think our guys probably just burned the city, like in the immediate aftermath of the fire. But then Washington's own like staff officers and the newspaper writers get to work saying, all right, it looks like we promised we were promising to burn the, the city all summer and that the city just burned. But don't connect those dots. Instead, what we want you to think is the American army was seven miles outside of town. Washington asked Congress for permission and Congress said no. So that's all you need to know. And look at how bad the behavior of the British are. They killed a few people on the spot. You know, those pl- Hessians were plundering all over. Uh, people, the, the, the British soldiers were slitting people's throats. Not true. They're killing women and children. Not true. But like all this other like gobbledygook winds up in the newspapers. And some of it seems to be coming from Washington's own headquarters. Essentially, a disinformation campaign to kind of say to American newspaper readers like, Pay no attention to that story that the loyalists are about to tell you. We've got our own story about what's going on here. And that becomes the story, essentially, that's uh, cemented in the, in the history books. And you can see it in, like, Franklin writing to si- Benjamin Franklin writing to Silas Dean over in France, like, okay, you're going to see this story from the British newspapers. Here's what to tell our potential our allies in Paris. Um, you know, tell this version of the story, not that version of the story. Um, it's really odd. Right. So I don't think I have Washington dead to rights as far as oh Washington definitely ordered the burning of uh, uh, New York City. I don't have evidence that proves that definitively, but I definitely have evidence that Washington's men were massaging the, uh, the, the information that was out there for people. Mm-hmm. So you were saying that that was the, the top down version and the bottom up version would involve more the rank and file soldiers. But in the book, you also 
suggest that we should be looking at a broader population, women, African Americans, uh, Native Americans. You want to talk a little bit about some of those people yeah. that came into the story? Yeah, I have two stories that are very suggestive that, it, that this wasn't just, a, like we're used to white guys being the principal actors, whether we're talking about the signing of the Declaration of Independence and the doings of Continental Congress, right? All those guys are, 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 white, are, are white men. Or the service in the Continental Army, which is not a completely white army, but, you know, largely that's our vision is that they're, is that they're ordinary white folk. But there are two suggestions that it was not just white folk who part, white men who participated in the burning of New York City. One is a story of a woman who was supposedly caught by British soldiers, like kneading gunpowder into ball, into balls uh, to be used as incendiary material. She's there bes- behind St. Paul's. She's caught doing this and was maybe killed by the British soldiers on the spot. The first woman of the United States to be killed by the British Army, if that story is true. And there's some corroboration that this may have been true. We don't know her name, but the idea that a woman, a civilian woman, would have been participating in the burning of New York City is super intriguing. Intriguing, intriguing enough that the famous opposition uh, member of parliament, Edmund Burke, who was like sort of in favor of the American cause, he gives a speech about her in November 1776 on the floor of the House of Commons. Like, fascinating. Right. So some suggestion that there may have been female involvement. I don't get into the story too much in the book because I also wrote a separate essay about it for an edited volume called Women Waging War in the American Revolution, uh, edited by Holly Mayer. So that's a fascinating story. And there's also one piece of evidence that a person of color was involved in burning New York City as well. Um, This is a story that's told kind of secondhand by a, a Connecticut colonel who was stationed in Paulus Hook, New Jersey, uh, named John Durkee. He supposedly told this story to a um, a loyalist in uh, a loyalist named uh, John Le Chevalier Room. He says, "I sent an expedition of eight men on a whaleboat across the Hudson River to burn the city. Um, it, one of them was mulatto or a mixed race man. Um, eight of these guys went over to New York. Only six of them came back because the British threw two of them into the fire, including this mixed race man." who was thrown into Ames's house. Ames was the surname of a New York City house owner, um, uh, you know, on Broad Street. So uh, totally fascinating. Now, Durkee commanded a New London County regiment. New London County pretty much always had men of Native American and African American descent in their units. Um, You can see it in 1775. You can see it in 1776. The records are not complete for 1776. So we don't know like, oh, this soldier is no longer like collecting pay after this day. So it's very hard to nail down who this person might have been, but he very well could have been of Pequot descent or of African-American descent. Durkee himself probably knew the difference between someone who was fully Pequot and somebody who was of mixed race uh, because they were part African-American and part white. But again, because this is a secondhand story, it's a little bit murky. So again, two nameless people, a mixed race man and, uh, and a woman who's described as smutted over. We actually don't know what racial category she would have belonged to. Um, you know, but this idea that there were these two shadowy figures that we, you know, that we learn from just these scattered accounts um, who also would have participated in conjunction with white men, you know, uh, you know white uh, officers in the Continental Army, uh, white civilians, you know, uh, but, but, but there was this big group, uh, but that group may not have only been all male and all white. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, we think of the American army as becoming integrated, you know, in, under Truman in 1948. But in fact, it was very integrated from the beginning, especially those New England units. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's important. Yeah, further south, they weren't as willing to yeah. incorporate African-Americans into their army as anything other than auxiliaries. But, um, but they were willing to give guns and equivalent duty and equivalent pay to black soldiers uh, in a lot of the New England regiments. So... I think we're, we've got about 15 minutes left. I, I don't know, is this a good moment to open it up to questions, or how did you want to do it? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's so many more stories that we could tell. You know, I don't have a, an extensive amount of slides, but I, I can get into any of the images that you saw there. I am happy to answer other questions. And I want to say before we end the formal part of the program, the reason why uh, Barnett's questions are so well informed is uh, he wrote a brilliant book on the history of the American Revolution in New York City, uh, The Battle for New York, uh, where he you know, he was the first person to really devote an entire chapter to the fire. Like, I mean, really, since William Henry Shelton kind of got it in his head that Nathan Hale might have been involved in the, which was 100 years ago, Um, you know, and then, uh, and then it was Barnett who really had like, I'm going to write a full chapter on the fire, 
got into a lot of the evidence that um, you know that was that was known to historians because you know some of it had been reprinted by Stokes and by the Valentine's Manual and um, and other stuff. A lot of this information was already out there in print in in sources that were readily accessible to um, to historians. Uh, but yeah, I mean that's that's the reason he knows this stuff in such minute detail. His his book, more than any other book that touches on New York City and the American Revolution, is a book that you can use as a guide wandering around New York City's landscape today because he's constantly making connections to, yes, this is what happened in the 18th century, and this is the exact block you should go to in Brooklyn, in Queens, in Staten Island, Manhattan, in the Bronx, if you want to under, if you want to envision where these people were. Um, so I want to make sure that we all understand like that I'm being interviewed here by one of the foremost experts uh, in the world and not just a smart guy who read my, uh, uh, who read my book. Um, so I do, I, you know, uh, you can still find that book, uh, you know, for sale in lots of places. And so if this is a broader interest of yours, if you want to know more about New York City and the revolution and not just the fire, um, you know, uh, by, by that, by that book too. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we did it. We did a very enjoyable tour together with some. Yeah. With Brooklyn college students. When I taught, uh, I taught an upper level colloquium on New York City and the American revolution, uh, and Barnett led a, a, a tour of. Uh, Prospect Park's role um, uh, during the, the during the Battle of Britain. Battlefields are right here outside the door. <laughs> yeah, and actually being able to show us the topography, right? Like here's where you'd want to, you know, hole up to try and stop British advance, right? Go and, and wander through these places. They're not incredibly well marked. You, you know, you need an informed guide um, to really get a sense of that. It was terrible weather that day, unfortunately. That was the only bum, bummer part of it. Uh, but yeah, it was neat. Yeah, Vicky. So was the fight, because from what um, we've heard so far, I didn't think the fire was that big. I thought the was the massive, like, spread several, several, several neighborhoods from the state where I might know the now is, all the way down towards um, Yeah, if you want to orient yourself, this triangle here that's called the Common, that's City Hall Park. Um, so that's the best landmark that I can uh, that I can give. Um, this is Trinity Church, right? So this is Wall Street, um, and this is St. Paul's. So as far as current uh, uh, landmarks, those are the best ones that you can use. Uh, to orient yourself. A lot of accounts agree that the wind was going really strong that way, right? And that's really what explains. But as far as how New York City was divided up into the time, at the time, what's burned is, this is most of what's called the South Ward and the West, uh, and the West Ward. New York was uh, uh, divided into about seven wards. Uh, it depends on whether you count, like, all of Northern Manhattan as the outward or whatever, but... Um, uh, yeah, uh, New York was sort of divided into wards, and it's almost the entirety of, of two of those neighborhoods, essentially. Can you repeat what you were saying before when you first pulled this map up? You were saying that you would think that the, the wind would be a sufficient explanation, but you said it's also suspicious that some of the most valuable buildings were in the, the real business district on the east yeah. So this is a map. Unfortunately, the um, the resolution didn't survive my uh, transporting it to PowerPoint. Uh, but I worked with a geographer named uh, uh, Bill Keegan in Connecticut, and this is one of the maps that he made for me in the book. Um, and all of the squares with dots are where incendiaries were uh, caught or somehow dealt with, and all of the little flame areas are spaces where uh, an ignition. Uh, was uh, was discovered, or a cache of incendiary materials was discovered. So most of these ignition points are within the burned area, but some of them aren't, right? And so there's some idea that maybe we're we're um, we're observing right the, the the other parts of the city that the Americans might have tried to burn. This is the part that was successfully burned, but maybe there were attempts uh, further east. To burn it as well, but you can see that the East River, with all these wharves sticking out into the uh, into the East River, is much more commercially developed. The Hudson River really only had a couple of little wharves and uh, and a ferry to New Jersey, but the commercial and 
the ship outfitting district was really this all the way up to here. That's where a lot of New York's industrial and commercial capacity was. So in a way, the fire didn't work because it didn't burn the most valuable part of the city. What it burned was the Customs House down here, Trinity Church, uh, Trinity Lutheran Church, which is here, Trinity Church, uh, a few mansions along Broadway, as I said, and then these were all church lands with working class wooden housing uh, on leased land from Trinity Church, really modest uh, 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 housing. So some of the sufferers were very poor, a few of them were middle class, and then a, a very small portion of them were extremely wealthy, but of course they're the ones who are mentioned in newspapers because, you know, it's sort of like the society pages of a later era, everybody wanted to know um, uh, uh, what had happened to the fanciest people. Yeah, um, when you say incendiary, was it just like a yeah, trails of gunpowder, super explosive, but also um, wood dipped in turpentine or rosin. Um, a match in those days was actually about this long, and it would either be a wooden stick dipped in brimstone, or it would be like uh, a flammable material wrapped up in a piece of, piece of cloth about this long, right? It's only later that like a match that's only this long was developed, um, like a, a, a self-striking match. Um, so uh, people were found with bundles of matches, with ba barrels of gunpowder. Uh, I, I, I list, you know, all of this stuff. And I even have a cartoon of Thomas Paine where he, he is surrounded by incendiary materials because he was thought to be a kind of metaphorically incendiary guy. So I have an image, I don't have it on the slideshow, but in the book that shows what some of these uh, 18th century combustible materials looked like. They weren't explosive on the level of like napalm or C4 or more modern, uh, uh, modern chemical inventions, but uh, you still could make, you know, very explosive material, um, uh, uh, you know, for, for a variety of purposes in the 18th century, some of which had ordinary civilian uses, some of which had military uses, right? Like a fire ship, right? You could take an old junky ship, fill it with combustible materials, and then send it after a British warship, light it on fire and send it after a British warship in order to burn that ship down. The Americans tried that a couple of times in New York Harbor. Uh, um, so it could be that some of that stuff was lying around and being used for that. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about incendiary materials of one kind or another. Yeah, I mean, the Americans, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to ask, how long does it describe how they do it in different ways? Like, what is the goal? Yeah, it's you know I keep getting asked this question, and it's really making me regret that I didn't spend more time uh, time on it on the book. People are fascinated by the the rebuilding of this this section. So that area, the shaded area, is known for a few years after the war as Canvas Town, right? Because it's basically like some brick husks, and then people would drape canvas sails as roofs, right? If you think about a shanty town, it was kind of the equivalent of an 18th century shanty town. Uh, and actually like uh, self-emancipated slaves from the South, when they came to New York for refuge with the British army, lived there. Uh, people who were otherwise unhomed lived there. Uh, poor, poor people, you know. Um, so it, 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 was, it, it was during the war, the British never really be, rebuilt it. And so it's known as Canvas Town during the British occupation. But even after the British have left, it kind of remains that way for a while until eventually New York is like, all right, we've got enough money now. Let's build Greenwich, what's now Greenwich Street, right? Uh, and eventually, right, they'll even build landfill around there. Like the World Trade Center is actually the same area of lower Manhattan, but that's all on landfill. It's, it's you know, it's not that, that, that was water back then and is now, um, you know, and so the coastline of lower Manhattan actually looks different nowadays than it did then. Um, but it takes a while. Uh, and actually, some 19th century writers, including some of the men who founded the New York Historical Society and the Museum of the City of New York, are like, you know what, in a way, it's a good thing we have this fire. You know, this is what New York should be doing. It should be destroying the old, you know, twisty, crumbling structures and building something better for the next generation of money making in New York. You know, it's, you know, it's almost a shame that more of the city didn't burn for that reason, right? Because like, that drive to like, build something new to, you know, to, to build taller and taller buildings eventually, right? That that's what that valuable uh, uh, real estate in New York should be used for. So interestingly, they don't rebuild very fast. 
Um, and it's known as, as Canvas Town for many years. Washington Irving, whose birthday I think was yesterday, uh, is actually born just a couple of blocks from there in 1783. His, 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 his family had mostly stayed in town. So I've always wondered whether Irving's family knew something, you know, about the, the fire. Of course, when Irving writes his biography of George Washington, he says Washington had nothing to do with it. Um, yeah. So after, like, finishing publishing your book and like, looking at all the sources, the archives, what can, can you include, like, was it accidental or was it a Washington order? Like, I can't say for sure whether it was Washington's orders, but I definitely don't think it was an accident. And I definitely don't think it was the British, right? The, uh, um, you, you know, I, I definitely think it was a purposeful act by a, a set of radical, uh, I, uh, like that was motivated by a set of radical ideas on the American side. Whether that, that radicalism rose as high as Washington himself is r really difficult. Uh, I mean, the truth is most historians who have looked at the fire uh, since World War II, you know, before World War II, it was like Washington, you know, he was so great. Even British historians start to say Washington, was, you know, had, had such a, a, a noble strength of character that he never would have done this. So biographies of Washington, you know, uh, patriotic histories of New York City, uh, histories of the Revolutionary War, either don't mention the fire or say it, it was an accident or say, oh, it was just a bunch of miscreants who did it, who had no political character to them at all. This is a non-story. Let's move along. Um, after World War II, historians see that letter for you know where he says Providence or some good honest fellow is done. We didn't see fit, fit for themselves, but still historians were reluctant to say, "Oh, it was a deliberate act." They say it's mysterious, and we'll never know. I wasn't really satisfied with that. To me, you have to ignore the accounts of basically every eyewitness which said, hey, we saw it break out at multiple places at once. We caught guys in the act. You have to basically say that all those accounts were biased in order to conclude that there was, there was no purposeful action at all. So I think that, you know, again, we don't have a letter saying, hey, I burned New York City today, right? Uh, we're not going to, it's too late for forensic evidence. We can't interview any of the witnesses, but you can convict even nowadays on circumstantial evidence. And I think that the circumstantial evidence that this was a deliberate act is significant and, and conclusive. One more curious question, because of how you said about missionary things place. Do you think that it's hard to know? It's hard to know because when you when you start a fire like this in dry conditions with high wind, you don't know what it's going to do next. The wind can shift, right? Like so, there's no planning, right? Once you've set a big enough fire, uh, and there's some suggestion, right, that they set Trinity Church on fire separately on the other end, right? Uh, um, you know, uh, and that the, uh, and that there were separate fires in a bunch of different places. So that's what you would do if you were gonna try and set an entire city on fire is you'd spread your guys out over as much of the city as you can safely do without getting caught and you would light a bunch of very flammable stuff on fire, uh, let it burn up a wooden building and then let it, let it just sow chaos and catch from building to building. Um, you wouldn't have to set every individual house on fire. You would just have to have enough of those fires get big enough to, for flashover to occur and for spread to start. I actually sent Chapter 7, which describes the fire, to a fire scientist in Kentucky um, to kind of say, like, you know, given your um, your expertise on the investigation of arson cases, is there anything I should be looking for? You know, and he said, well, I don't think, a, you, you know, I, if I were testifying before a jury today, I wouldn't be able to say for sure that it was one thing or the other. But he still, you know, was kind of like, well, you, you know, uh, you, you definitely have suggestive evidence that can, uh, that can point to either um, an accidental fire or... Uh, multiple points of ignition indicating uh, a purposeful fire. Well, I think that's... Yeah, we, uh, are we out of time. I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not keeping time, but thanks to everybody for your questions. And thanks for that. Thank uh, okay. My students that are here have a wonderful spring break. And I will see you in the <laughs>
wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> 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 